Good morning, good morning, and welcome to our sunrise safari. For those of you who are joining us for the first time on these live safaris on this chilly morning in the African bush, it is a apparently 17 degrees centigrade, which is around 62 Fahrenheit. But with the wind chill factor, it definitely feels colder, and we're shivering away as we head across to Cheetah Plains. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie and I have Viam on camera with me this morning. We're going off to the southern boundary, of course, to check to see if Karula, the Queen of Juma, has decided to return. Karula, of course, being one of the world's most beloved leopards. Now, if you do have any questions that you'd like to send through to us, you can send them through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email them through to questions at wildearth.tv oh, wonderful thing oh hello here's an elephant found an elephant or an elephant found us and very kindly put a roadblock in the road sorry elephant that's okay didn't take kindly to our presence first thing in the morning we are coming to you live from hmm Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves. Let's see if we can't push this out of the road. Come on, Wendy, you can do it. No, Wendy can't do it. A broker. A broker. <laughs> Me and trees in the road, man. You shouldn't be put together. Ah, oh, and my beanie's popping up again. Oh, sorry, everybody. Right, what I was going to say is that we're actually coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves in the, the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. I'm sorry, big girl. Good morning. Aren't you beautiful in this morning light? Yes. Hello. Obviously not putting light on her, just because she clearly didn't enjoy it the first time around. And as a daytime animal, elephants don't really appreciate too much light on them. A nice, peaceful way to start off the morning. Hyenas are singing off somewhere on the southern boundary. Pretty much an idyllic start. Ghost bird whistling off in the distance. Grey headed bushrike. gentle sounds of elephants munching. Of course, this is how they've spent most of their evening. Elephants don't really need to sleep in the same way that we do. So they would have been wandering about, feeding all night. It's amazing. The last few days, they have just been elephants for days. Not that I've seen that many of them, but the other presenters have. The other guides have definitely seen multiple elephant herds. And they've been there's been herds of well, well over a hundred in certain places. And then, of course, Brent saw that elephant with a really short trunk yesterday, that big bull that we saw for the first time just a couple of weeks ago. A nice chilly start. I don't think we're going to sit for too long with this particular herd, just because it is still quite dark. And they are in relatively thick bush. But we, I'm sure we shall encounter some more elephants on our way through, just because that seems to be the pattern. Hey, big girl. And as our lovely young elephant cow wanders off into the distance, we have the lovely Louise and Rebecca in final control. They also extend their good morning greetings. There's one other person, there's two other people that would like to say good morning to you, and that is Brent and Jandre. So let's get onto the back of the vehicle with them. Good morning, and look how joyful it is. I have found my other mate. 
Yay! Uh, my name is Brent Vio Smith. I am cold. I have Jandre on camera, who's also cold, but we're out in hunt of wonderful animals. I'm very excited to have you all here on Safari Live. And we're going up to the northwestern corner to check for any signs of lions. So I've got some good news about lions and I've got some bad news about lions. The good news is the lions have a meal. The bad news is the lions have a meal outside of our traverse So literally about three minutes after we ended the sun set safari last night and we're driving home, I was listening to the game drive radio and the Birmingham boys caught a buffalo. I'm not sure if it's a big buffalo, a small buffalo. And the Nkumas were less than a kilometer away, so I'm quite sure they would have heard that commotion and moved in. I will find out uh, when the other vehicles are out exactly what's going on there. We're hoping it's a small buffalo so they can move uh, towards us. The closest water, I think, to where they are is the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. So we will be taking a gander. Fingers crossed, being the eternal optimist we are, and the lions may have walked into uh, Juma for a drink. But till then, we're going to be in search of any wonderful and wild creature out here in the African bush. So, lion dynamics are always in flux. There's always a bit of movement around him. Sid from Barrington Hills would like to know what's going on with the coalitions, the prides, and, and everything at the moment. Well, Sid, it's, 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 it's never as simple as you think it is. So, at the moment, the Birmingham boys are still the main coalition up here. One of them has died, and there are four left. That is not unusual. Male lions do leave a very tough life. Now, the Inkahuma is still our major pride. Unfortunately for us, they have been on Juma, but they've literally just slipped across during the night and moved to the north um, or to the west. So, very interesting that. Now, we had the Tsalala pride and the Tsalala breakaways up here for a while, and that was after the Majingalans and the Matimbas had a bit of a, a spat and they all ran around for a while and we got two prides of lions we don't normally see uh, up here. It seems like things have settled down. The Majinga lions have gone back to the west. The Matimbas have returned to the south and the Salalas and Salala breakaways have gone back to their normal sort of haunts. However, a few mornings ago on the Sunrise Safari, we found what we think, they were too far away to be sure, with two young males from the breakaway pride who got left behind in all this pandemonium. So we are not sure where they've gone. I haven't found any tracks coming across and heading back towards the more traditional area. So they might still be stuck in the north and they might have gone into the Manuleti. But one must remember that this is an open system. Oh, morning babblers, babbling away. So it is an open system. So there's a constant, there's constant movement of lions all around. I mean, and it can stay relatively settled for a while, but another lion, another coalition of males might come in from the north or from the east, from Kruger or Manuleti, and throw a spanner in the works. You never know what's going to happen. And that is one of the most amazing things about working in an open system like this. Uh, we are part of the Greater Limpopo Trans Trans Frontier Park, which is over 11 million acres of unfenced wilderness. And of course, there are boundaries that us as humans can't cross, but that doesn't stop the cats at all, or any of the other animals for that matter, who are able to meander where they please. So we're just coming past Sydney's water hole in the open areas here. We're just having a careful look in this low light. Now, <clears throat> Lions and, and leopards are a little bit harder to spot in the low light. And I'm just going to check very carefully. That's no sign of any. Well, it seems as though the prediction about there being. Lots and lots of elephants all over the place is coming true. 
No matter where we go this morning, we are treated to scenes like this. Isn't this beautiful? This is actually one of my favorite spots on Juma. There's a little pan at the back and this termite mound and the elephants are just having an absolute field day. Bless you, Vian. Thank you. I know the feeling. It's very dusty. It would have been highly appropriate if one of the elephants had sneezed quickly, but not today. Isn't that beautiful? All the youngsters wandering about, and that young female coming across in front of us. <laughs> this little herd has got three calves of a very similar age, all around two, two and a half. And demonstrating that close bond that all elephant cousins have. And by that I mean the littlest one always wants what the older one is feeding on. Doesn't matter what it happens to be. I mean, they have picked the tree with the <laughs> least amount of leaves. They've decided to go for a caterpillar bush. Which is a bit of a struggle when you can't use your trunk all that well. It's a bit finicky. Beautiful old girl. Oh, sorry. Beautiful big boy. Sorry, mister. It is semi-darkness. Oh. <laughs> oh, quick, quick, quick fall over. Sometimes the back legs just don't hold you up like they should. Hey, little one. Let's just go forward ever so slightly, just so that we've got the bush out of the way and we can watch the antics of the little ones. Put ourselves in a nice position. Here we go. Don't you find it fascinating how baby elephants just love to do a quick headstand every now and again? And practice their morning yoga. And just like toddlers, baby elephants are much more flexible than the adults. <laughs> and sometimes you just have some breakfast, even if it does mean the most tricky tree you can get. Most of you will have noticed that a lot of the elephants at the moment, their eyes are streaming. And that's for the same reason that Viam and myself are sneezing our way through the morning. There's lots of dust about, although the... Ha ha! <laughs> Somebody's having a weaning tantrum. There's so much dust about, it is actually hurting their eyes a little bit. The rain washed most of it down yesterday. Our surprise rainfall that had us a little bit concerned that we were going to freeze on the afternoon safari. Here we go. It's a bit boring being a baby elephant sometimes because you don't need to eat as much as the adults do. And you need to find other ways of entertaining yourself. Ah. We've got a big ball that's going to come and join the rest of the herd. Here he comes. Hmm, a really interesting question as we find ourselves surrounded by the gentle rumblings of the elephant herd. Lucy in South Bend, Indiana was wondering how large an elephant lungs are. It's a really good, good question. We know roughly that their hearts are absolutely enormous. As to their lungs, I'm going to try and guess, Lucy, but I don't claim to know offhand. And I do remember watching one of those documentaries on the autopsy of an elephant. So I should know this, but I cannot remember off the top of my head. But I mean, for a five-ton animal, we're probably looking at, what would we guess? 
maybe 200 odd pounds, maybe that's a little bit much. Maybe, maybe 150. I'm guessing, Lucy, but I will actually try and find out and let you know. It's a brilliant question. As for hippo, they're structurally adapted to be almost or semi-aquatic. They can hold their breath for extended periods of time. But again, probably a very, very large lung capacity. I'm sorry, I wish I could give you a more accurate answer. Maybe Brent has a better idea than I do. I, I don't, couldn't begin to actually accurately guess. But it is a really interesting question. And the, and the anatomy of these animals is fascinating. The structures needed to be put in place to maintain such an enormous body size are in themselves quite mind-boggling. The <laughs> little one running after mom at the back. <laughs> the females all ducking out of the way of that large bull. Young males. Lots of eddies all around. There we go, there's some more on our right as well. This could be part of the same herd that we saw earlier, or it could actually be a second herd. Elephants, of course, are not territorial in any way. They have home ranges and they have places that they like to hang out in, which is why we get familiar with some of our elephant characters. But they're quite happy to associate with other elephant groups. using the back of the foot to scrape away and oh struggling there there we go using toenails getting them to work this is a relatively young elephant somewhere sort of if i had to guess around maybe seven or eight but sarah you were wondering about the little calves oh no you're gonna come say no no just wants the food there sarah was wondering about the little calves earlier and how old I thought they were. Sarah, I guessed at about two to two and a half. You see, that you're trying to age an elephant calf. It's around three years old when the tusks start to poke through properly. Now that, of course, will differ from elephant to elephant. So it's a matter of just practicing and looking at the size of the elephants compared to the adults. Is anyone mobile? Oh, good morning, Lex. Print will get that. And there's a tiny little baby also coming to emerge at the back. So if I had to guess, sir, if we look at this little one, although its tusks haven't come through yet, look how tall it is. I know the sense of scale is quite difficult, but it probably, if I stood next to that little one, would come very close to being up to chest height. I would put it at over three years old. Now, aging calves is difficult because each and in every single individual elephant will have a different pattern of growth to their tusks. I'm just going to listen to the game ground updates for one second. you see it. The presence of these wonderful animals so close to the vehicles is always an absolute pleasure. Yes, I know. You agree, or maybe not. No, little one. Also with eyes streaming. The dust affected all of the eggs out here. Now if this were a male calf, it would probably have come to give us a little bit of a head shake, a little bit of a head toss. But it's a female. Oh, she's relatively peaceful. And they've slowly moved across to the back of our vehicle. Most of our elephants at the moment are in quite dense vegetation. I'm going to turn around. I just want to make sure nobody's too close to me so I don't give anybody a fright. 
especially because Wendy's current starting position is takes a little bit of time. It's not exactly the most subtle maneuver in the world. Now, while we reposition, I'm going to send you across to Brent, who's got an update for you from the Game Drive channel. So I've got an update on the Lions uh, from Lex, who was there last night. So the Birmingham's, two of them killed a, a buffalo, Sabelo buffalo, and then the Inkahumas were found at about nine o'clock, lying up on Chile Cup line, so right on our eastern boundary. Now, fingers crossed that they decided to come further into Juma. I do have the, the sneaking suspicion that they might have moved to join the Birmingham's on that buffalo carcass, but you never know. So we're heading down towards the eastern boundary uh, to see if we can find any sign of those lovely Inkahuma lionesses. As we go on this undulating road, it's really cold in the bottom. So Debbie's wondering what happened to the Birmingham male that died. Uh, as far as I know, he had a, a hole in his lung from a, a buffalo, but the carcass was removed and taken for testing. Uh, not often do the veterinary services get hold of a carcass. Normally hyenas will rip it up, take it apart, or even other lions sometimes, or other scavengers, vultures. So it's a really, really, really important that if we can, like with that in Kahuma lioness, uh, veterinary services will come take that away, and they'll test for disease, genetics, uh, and run a whole bunch of tests on that carcass. So it went off to Sand Park's veterinary services is what happened to the carcass of that dead Birmingham male. Oh, fascinating. Uh, Jamie seems to have a tailless elephant. I wonder if it's the same one we saw on safari a few days ago. We were chatting about the elephant with a half a trunk earlier this morning. Now we have this Ellie bull without a tail. I'm not entirely sure if this is the same elephant bull that you've been seeing with around Cheetah Plains. I believe that you saw it with James and you might have seen it with Sam as well. Now I know that when questioned, James suggested it might have been ticks that were responsible for the loss of the tail. It seems to me to be the most likely explanation. I mean, it's, it's possible that lions tackled this Ellie bull when he was a little bit younger, but smaller. They just certainly wouldn't be attempting it now. But the lions of the Sabi Sands have never really needed to resort to elephant killing or elephant hunting. It's more something that occurs in Botswana. But it's interesting how it changes your perception of that elephant's body language. You know, of course, that we're always looking at the tail and the ears and the trunk to gauge an elephant's mood. And with this guy, we're missing one piece of the puzzle. And that, of course, is not going to do him any serious damage. It won't cause him any... Probably is he might be a little bit uncomfortable, might put him more at risk of ticks around the softer areas of the skin. But other than that, he's not in any great peril from the loss of a tail. An elephant tail, apart from being a vis visual cue to other elephants, doesn't really serve a tremendous purpose in the same way a leopard or a lion's tail does. And as with anything, as with that elephant with half a trunk, animals are very, very resilient and very good at learning to compensate. lovely bull. William is complimenting Viet on his camera work, which I am in complete agreement with. William says it's the first time he's ever seen a, an elephant use its feet to get its food. And, oh, quick beat away at the grass, get rid of the dust. And they do do it relatively regularly, but of course a lot of the time we see elephants there in quite dense vegetation. 
hidden away behind it and it's a bit tricky to zoom in right on what they're doing with their feet. But whenever it comes time to uproot something, it is one of the techniques that we they use. There you go, see the waxy glob in the corner of his eye? That's just from dust collecting and his eye produces that substance to help to protect it. And that's what that whiteness is all around him. Now, William, I'm not sure if you ever saw the elephant with the half a trunk, elephant bull, but what was fascinating about him was that he actually used his feet as a really integral part of his feeding pattern. He'd kick, because he didn't have his trunk to reach down and to pluck the grass, he'd uproot the grass and by kicking it, digging with his toenails, and then would form, roll it into a, a half a ball with his front foot. You know that elephants do have very well formed, quite thick toenails for that purpose. And then he'd bend right down. Oh, got a female who was not terribly impressed with the overtly friendly attentions of that male without a tail. <laughs> Her male calf scuttling behind. Not quite entirely sure as to what's going on, just knowing that he probably should stay out of the way. Sorry, boy. No luck for you today. Oh, he's definitely interested. But she is definitely not. He finds himself disappointed. Well, that behavior is relatively common. He is a little bit young to have had a chance to mate with the females. It's usually when a female comes into estrus, somehow the largest elephants in the area, the biggest bulls, will actually come and associate with the herd and usually basically push away any of the smaller, slightly younger males. He is only just getting to the stage where he's ready to mate with females. And even then, even though he's been sexually mature since around 15, an elephant bull usually has to wait till about 30 before he can mate. So he's just chancing his luck, really, checking to see if that female's an estrus. But inexperience is speaking for him, because if she were an estrus, she would definitely be announcing it to him and to the rest of the herd. Oh, a quick display of size. I think the gentleman on the right is the winner so far. A relatively peaceful conflict between two young males. And what was communicated there, we will never know. But probably went something along the region of, you're, you, you're fine, buddy, just don't get in my way. There's plenty of ladies to go around, though those are a little bit young. As we watched the younger elephants, and we spoke a bit about aging them, Sandy, good morning to you and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know if baby elephants grow through teething phases like human beings do, or if they're born with their teeth, or how does it work? The answer is they do actually have milk teeth. They do get milk tusks that you hardly ever see. Sometimes they might protrude a little fraction of an inch out of the skin, but other than that, you hardly ever see them. And then they shed those around two and a half, three, and they start to grow their permanent set. And it's around five years old that they lose their first set of molars and they start to grow their second. So they do teeth. They teeth just like human beings. Their milk teeth start coming through at around four to six months. At about six months is when they start to eat solid food as well as to drink milk. already then they are ready to start chewing so sandy no they are not born with teeth as i said they go they come through at about four to six months and it can be quite painful quite unpleasant for a little elephant just like with children they get niggly and grumpy and uncomfortable and what they'll do is they'll go and chew on the leaves of the tree that's actually currently in front of our elephant the silver cluster leaf tree or even a spike thorn tree and Sandy, you know how we... Oh, hello. <laughs> You're in my way. <laughs> Move. I want to be there. 
Look at her ear. Isn't she fascinating? But yes, sadly, they'll chew on the leaves of the silver cluster leaf because it actually helps to soothe the teething pains. Oh, lots of interested males, young males in this herd, and lots of very disinterested females. I love her ear. Very stylish. Punk rocker elephant. Bill, good morning. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering whether elephants will ever consciously play pranks on other elephants. It's a really interesting question. I've never seen it happen, but I don't necessarily think that it's impossible. I have definitely seen elephants, particularly bulls, and particularly bulls in must. I've seen them look at me, look at a tree, look at me again, and just push it into the road in front of me. For no reason, they don't go and feed on it afterwards. They're quite, quite literally <laughs> showing off how big and strong they are, but also they're clever enough to know we drive on the roads. It's also easier, of course, for them to feed around a road because there's not that many bushes to move about. But I have genuinely seen them do that to me. Have I ever seen any evidence of pranks in a more complex way? No, I've, I've seen them play together rough and tumble and roll each other over. But not, nothing to the extent of... She's not interested, buddy. She's really not. <laughs> You're being a bit of a bully now, buddy. No. I said that females in estrus will announce it to the rest of the herd. They have, in the height of their estrus cycle, they have what's known as an estrus walk, which is similar to a must swagger. Lots of head swinging, running around with her tail held high in the air. And she is very clearly not, but they do play hard to get. It is a standard elephant response. Beautiful sunrise. Absolutely lovely morning. Nice peaceful start with elephants all around us. Lovely. Let's try and go a little bit further forward. Now, Safari Dean, with regards to our tailless elephant, who has attempted unsuccessfully to woo at least two ladies while we've been watching, you're wondering if he might be unsuccessful in propagating his genes because he might be perceived as inferior. And no, I don't think so. I, I doubt that that's going to make too much of a difference. you've got projected doesn't mean you can come running out to me, buddy. Nope. No. Probably the, the best view we're going to get for now. Oh, no, that's not him. I thought it was him. I think it's just a female trying, or a young male trying to escape. The bigger tailless elephant. Safari Dean? No. I mean, in terms of selecting for a potential mate, The female will go for the elephant, the largest male that she can see. Usually an elephant bull in must. She does show a slight preference for must. And she's looking for body size and size of tusks. As long as he can compete, as long as he is on equal footing in terms of size with the other elephant bulls around, that will pretty much be him sorted. It's not something... Animals do not really perceive such a physical, not defects, but physical differences as inferior in any way. There's a chance, though, that if he were tuskless, for example, then he, things might be a little bit of a different story. And on the subject of our tailless elephant, 
Susan was wondering if it were ticks, why would not elephant would not no try that sentence let's try that whole sentence again sorry susan if it were ticks why would more elephants not have the same problem what it might have been is an injury some kind of a scratch in some way something that broke the skin made it slightly weaker there and that was why the ticks targeted it so it might just have been bad luck you've seen how elephants fight usually head to head, but sometimes the loser starts to move away and the, the winner pokes them in the bottom with their tusks. So that might have been something that happened. Otherwise, it might be a genetic defect in the elephant's tail. So remember how we spoke about the, the tailless lioness of the Salala pride and the fact that her daughter was also tailless. Both of them had their tails removed, apparently, by hyenas. But don't you find it quite a coincidence that, that both it happened to both of them in the same pride? It's not, impossible that it's coincidence but i suspect there might be a genetic link as well so it might just be that he had a slight defect in his genes that made his tail weaker than others maybe even the the vertebra the coccyx hadn't joined up properly while he was growing and it just made it slightly easier for the ticks to target it that's my explanation i haven't seen that many tailless elephants it's relatively rare but it is an interesting one oh this is a stem book from one of the largest animals to one of the smallest. In the presence of giants. I think if I were a steerbook, I'd spend quite a lot of time hanging out around elephants. I'd accept the risk of being chased, if only for the additional safety they might provide. Right, our Ellie's have actually disappeared. I have a question from Dave, and Dave, unfortunately, I can't find a nice young elephant to show you, but you wanted to know at what age does a female elephant have her, have her first calf and how many can she have in her lifetime? So the female elephants will come into their first estrus around 13 or so. Oh, there's two Stienbrook. Oh, how lovely. They were two Stenbok. Now there's one. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, I'll be with your question in a moment. Oh, off they go. Uh, since we really are sort of elephantless, there's one there. About 12 or 13, they'll come into their first estrus and they'll probably take some time to reach the full sexual maturity in a full estrus. But that's around the time that the males first start to show interest in them. And there's actually a very interesting physical adaption to mating at that age, because a, a, young, a young female, when she first mates, will probably only be about two tons, if around that weight, whereas a big adult bull could be close to six tons. That's a great deal of weight for her to be bearing on basically what is a not fully formed, not fully fused pelvis. And that's one of the reasons why elephant males have such dexterous penises because essentially they cannot afford to, the females cannot afford to carry their weight for them to try and find where they're going. Uh, it's, for elephants it's a very, very short affair, the whole mating. And that's why when you see, if you do see an elephant penis, they can actually move them almost independently. They've got a certain degree of control over them. And that's because young females could do could have serious damage done to them. And in terms of in terms of numbers, well, that I'll work out for you at a little bit of a later stage. Uh, somebody has asked if elephants yawn. I've never seen it. The good news is there is one big cat that does do plenty of yawning, and I'm going to send you across to Brent and his yawning lions. Look at this, a pair of lions. It's a big, dominant Birmingham boy and what looks to be the youngest of the Inkahuma pride. Now, they could very, they, sorry, not very, they are very much definitely mating. So this could be her first mating. And he's a bit grumpy. Sometimes lions do get a bit grumpy during mating. 
So there we go, the young Inkahuma lioness. And one of the Birmingham boys. And both look to have quite full bellies, thanks to the buffalo. The, the male has definitely got a far fuller belly than she does. Hopefully she doesn't go too far that way. That's a very thick little river system there. And he's up and on the move following her. And you can see that rotund belly of his. They're going down towards little river system there. We'll definitely keep up with them. We're just going to find a way to follow. Yeah. So I think there's a little sneaky spot down there that we can get into the river system with. She's moving through there. Let's have a look at her. Just want to see if she's laid down. There's an open patch there. No, she's still. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out where they're going. I'm going to go forward for you over there, John. There you got them. A tiny little gap through there. Oh, they just mated through the bush. And they're off on the move again. I just need to tell Lex what's going on. He's just arrived. Morning. They've just moved down into the into the drainage I'm going to, there is a way down through the side. I'll see if we can find them. So while we try reposition, guys, we're going to jump back across with Jamie and we'll be back shortly. It's not a bad start to the morning. First thing, and we've had elephants and mating lions and almost mating elephants. Oh, we're not doing too badly at all. Well, we've jumped on board at the right moment because it's time for us to search for the tracks of the Queen of Juma, our lovely Lady Leopard. Everything's very damp this morning, very dewy. Uh, it'll take us a while to, well, hopefully we should be able to spot them, but the soil's a little bit compacted. And as somebody once told me, Steph, that is, tracking leopards is on wet soil is like trying to follow tissue paper blowing across the ground. I'm very sorry, I've got a sneeze that's got stuck. <laughs> you know when it gets stuck and your eyes start to stream and you can't, you just can't. Just... Maybe I should look at the sun for a while, that might help. Either go away or, or happen, sneeze. Don't linger in the middle. Okay, I think we're good. I think we're safe. You're not going to be thrown off your chairs by the sudden explosive sneeze that occasionally takes us by surprise. Oh, no, it's back again. That's no good. You need to be able to use my eyes. Having them streaming is not going to help at all. Oh, we've had some really interesting shifts in leopard territories over the last few months. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen Karula so much in this area. And I'd love to know how much of her shift down to the south and further to the east had to do with the incoming young female, the Tsukani female, the daughter of Kutile, who is much younger and much bigger than Karuna herself, or whether or not her shift was prompted by the ever, the burgeoning hyena clan of Juma and the fact that they were denning so close to her regular den sites. 
Uh, it's not that it's not necessarily that her, that her territory boundaries have changed. It's that she's spending more time in different parts of her territory from where she used to. Now, obviously, I haven't come to that conclusion on my own because I've only been working here a year, so it hasn't come from just me. But I'm actually speaking to Mike Grover, who monitors all of the leopard populations and movements throughout the Sabi Sands. And we actually had a long conversation about this and what the reasons for it might have been. And then, of course, you've actually got the shifting male dynamics as well, because as far as we know, Karula hasn't been seen mating with the Anderson male. So she's tried to stay out of his way. Um, and with Mvula gone, Tingana pushing further east, maybe she's just trying to go with the flow to a certain degree. She was last seen hanging out in the Mulwati drainage line just to the south of our boundary with her two lovely cubs. Hopefully she's decided to come back and rejoin us. <laughs> we just take it in turns as guides to drive the southern boundary. It's on the off chance that she's decided to pop back across. slowly drive along our southern boundary. Some of you may be wondering, well, they're driving on a road, there's no fences to the right, how is that a boundary? And Kay, you were actually wondering, why is it that neighboring properties limit the number of vehicles that can traverse on them and why we aren't allowed to go there? Is it not, um, would it not bring tourism for the lodges? And is there any chance of expanding the traverse area? Is there any chance, let's start with the second question first. Is there any chance of expanding the traverse area? Yes. Watch the space. Yes, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, that being said, it's very important. It's something that's very carefully controlled for lots of reasons. And the Sabi Sands has one of the highest standards okay, of me, both conservation and, and guest experience in South Africa. And it's one of the pioneer projects in the, in the world. It is a model safari industry. If you have too many vehicles on your property, you automatically increase the impact that the vehicle has, just driving up and down, increased noise, increased off-roading, regardless of how well you off-road and how ethically you off-road. And then combine that with the fact that then there's extra people who want to go to a sighting. So we take up a space in a sighting, limited to three vehicles, mostly, in theory, two vehicles at every sighting. So, therefore, the guests at their lodges have to stay for a shorter period of time with the animal. It's a balance. It's a really delicate balance, and one that is very carefully controlled, and one that is, dare I say, somewhat political in nature, a little bit above my pay grade. I just, I go where they tell me to go. But yes, there is a chance. And not, you know, it, a lot of the, the lodges in this area do get our wonderful viewers coming to visit because they can experience and get to meet the characters that they've come to so enjoy. And that includes, I mean, that in, includes Juma, Voyotella and Gallagher. Anybody is more than welcome to come through and yeah. have a great chance because the, the, the Voyatella and the Gallego cars, vehicles, can traverse a much larger area. My short answer to that is it's complicated. Very, very complicated. But it is something that we're constantly aware of and working on. But, I mean, we've just, we've just gained Cheetah Plains, which is where we are slowly making our way to now. Just cruising along which was an exceptionally, is still exceptionally exciting for all of us. And that in turn has produced some incredible sightings already from ostriches to cheetah, to ostriches to cheetah and jackal, lots and lots of jackal. And of course, a change of scenery with those great open clearings. And you never know, the more people that we get watching, the more you tell your friends and your families to come and join us on the large safari vehicle that is Safari Live, the more we have things to play with and the further we can go. You never know where we might end up.
I know I'm excited. I hope you are. You all are too. She likes this drainage line. <laughs> James Richard. Um, James Richard would like to see an impala or any antelope this morning. Well, James, you are in luck, for I feel as though we can deliver upon such a request, and I plan on doing so shortly. Let's see. Okay, we must, we must be able to find an antelope. It would be a sad, sad day indeed. Oh, and we do have a two stand box. Already we've got one antelope for you. One type of antelope and two of them. So we're positively bounding ahead with our antelope sightings. Of course, I've said that now. I'm not going to see one impala. It will just be one of those days where I don't see the most common antelope in the Kruger National Park. There's only about 100,000 of them to see. <laughs> okay, sorry. That makes a great deal more sense. My apologies for the slight Chinese whispers that happened there. Um, <laughs> you wanted to see the tracks of any antelope. Well, now, now that's a different story. Actually, it's the same story because I should be able to find you those as well. Sorry, James. That, I, did, I did sort of question that in my mind. There you go, Biam. I did question your, <laughs> I did question that. And I did actually think you might have meant tracks. Hello, Floppy. What happened to your ear? Beautiful old giraffe bull. He looks familiar. I've definitely seen that scar on his neck before. Surveying his kingdom. That deep, rich coffee colour, or at least the way we make coffee in camp, that a mature bull giraffe will take on. Currently enjoying a, rum a, a rumination, a moment to ruminate. Oh, here we go, the next bolus has come up. He's got a slightly damaged ear. I would love to know how that happened. His right ear is absolutely perfect. And his left ear has got a little bit of a kink to it, a little bit of a flop. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channels <laughs> while, while we watch this uh, giraffe. <laughs> Brent and um, Lex discussing how on earth they're trying to get to these lions. It sounds as though it's something of a struggle. Just in case you were wondering where Brent has disappeared off to, he's somewhere tucked in the trees. So as we look at an animal that clearly isn't struggling with dwarfism, Sandy would like to know if there are any animals that do struggle or do um, get dwarfism out here? And the answer is yes, but it's very, very rare. And it's usually only where inbreeding due to human influence has taken place. So I've encountered a couple of dwarf lions in my time. Dwarf, dwarf lions with um, sort of very similar to the different types of dwarfism that you get in human beings. As for the other animals, I have never encountered it in the wild. I've never encountered any kind of dwarfism in the wild, but it is, as with any genetic slight abnormality, it is entirely possible. And sometimes you do get a giraffe with slight disproportions to their build. And I mean, the, the wonderful thing about genetics and evolution is that there are so many different types of genetic flukes that can occur. But it's very seldom in this wild environment that an animal like that would survive long enough to propagate the genes, which is why I say it only really occurs where human influence has played some kind of a role. 
And I swear he just stood up slightly taller in that moment. Nope, he's on his way. Oh, slight roadblock there. Are you going to take Central Road? I love watching yeah, on Road. how elegant a giraffe is, despite their long limbs. If I were a giraffe, I'd be constantly bashing my shin and stubbing my hoof and possibly even falling over. But especially if you think about it, there's a, there's a considerable blind spot for that giraffe. They cannot see down to where their feet are falling. And they've got to pick their way very carefully. Same with an elephant. <laughs> Their levels of spatial perception must be relatively well developed. That boy. <coughs> He's got lots of skin conditions, this gentleman. Not necessarily mange, but it could well be. And of course, the ox pickers that hang around a giraffe always play a role in increasing the size of their skin problems. Otherwise, a giraffe bull in his prime. There's little nicks and scratches. As we look at his beautiful pattern, each and every giraffe has a completely unique spot pattern. Some of our viewers are exceptionally good at identifying our individual giraffe of this area. I haven't managed to quite get to that stage. But it is impressive. And what that, what that does is it actually gives you an idea of the movements of the giraffe because you can't learn anything about their home ranges and their, where they walk without being able to identify or differentiate between each individual that you see. So we do start to get to know, especially since we view them through the eyes of the camera, which gets us a little bit closer than normal. And generally we spend a bit longer with them than you might on your average safari. It does, we do start to get to know them individually and where, where we're going to find them. What are their preferred spots? Oh, scratch time. He's going to use that poor bush willow as a really good tummy scratcher. Let's, let's put it that way. Getting to all of those ticks in the sensitive spots. I'm going to go forward a bit, it's quite funny. I'm not sure we're going to get the best view of it. Sort of at the wrong height. Oh, now that he's finished scratching, I'm just going to send you across to Brent very quickly so that he can tell you what's happening with those lines. So they've gone into this incredibly thick river system. So we've come around to the eastern side and we found a path through down to the bottom, but I need to concentrate quite heavily. I heard a Franklin alarm call just below us, so I think they're right in there. And I don't want to walk in because they can be quite aggressive while they're mating. And we know they're right here. So jean and I are going to go down into the drainage. And uh, hopefully, we'll be back in a minute or two with that mating pair of lions. In the meantime, let's go back to Jamie. Oh, well, Brent gingerly picks his way through the drainage line, trying to avoid the slightly upset lions and find them for you all. I've left our giraffe and we're going to continue on. I can't start heading across to Cheetah Plains just because whilst Brent is trying to find the lions my signal will disappear at certain moments. Now that's why we haven't struck a path to Cheetah Plains just yet. But this is one of Karula's favourite roads as well. So We've got plenty of opportunity to search for her. Oh, James. James, James, James. Let's try and find you a nice clear antelope track, shall we?
Oh, 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 whoopsie. Multitasking there. Right, well, I know a good patch for tracks. Hopefully, people haven't come driving along Cheetah Cut Line just yet. Maybe we'll get a chance to show you some Impala tracks there. I don't know if I mentioned, but... <laughs> <laughs> so James has said he's okay with the actual animal as well, not just the tracks. Particularly in Yarla and Bushbuck. Bushbuck are definitely one of my favourites. In fact, they might even be my favourite antelope in this area that we see regularly. So I'm with you on that. What I was going to say was, when we had Renius come through to test out our tracking skills, or at least our track identification skills, it was interesting how, for all of us, because we get so focused on following leopards, lions, or looking at unusual tracks, we were a little bit... Let's just say we had poor Renius shaking his head in despair at times at our track identification when it came to the antelope species. He just looked at us in horror at times, especially when we were getting Yala and Kudu confused. That's surprisingly difficult, though. Especially when you, you don't really focus on them. I can't remember when last I tracked down an Impala, but I can't say it has ever been... No, I've never tracked down an Impala. I've never followed and tracked an Impala. Oh, good. Our family of Batalera are here. Oh, our family of Batalera has flown away. Well, disappointing. They're usually quite relaxed. Which was very rude. Nope. Definitely gone. Oh well. They're not alarm calling, it's just cackling Franklins. Uh, when we first set out this morning, it was unfortunately for, for your portion of the sunrise fire, it was just that little bit too late. But when I got up this morning and we wandered out from across from Ingers to the DRC, where the main camp is, in the most spectacular almost full moon. And Betty Sleep, good morning. You were wondering, since it is nearly full moon, you were wondering about how that affects the behavior of the animals. Well, in a couple of ways. I mean, last night was dark, cloudy, windy, which of course is always a terrifying time if you're an antelope, because anything can sneak up on you, and probably every sound makes them think that a lion is about to jump on top of them. But during full moon, even people can see, if you let your eyes adapt to the darkness, you, you can almost see as well as you can, not quite as well as you can during the daylight, but you can certainly see relative, I could walk across quarantine I won't, it would be very silly, but I could in theory walk across quarantine um, and see everything in front of me. So th what that means is that first of all some of the diurnal predators might be hunting for longer. Wild dogs, cheetah are occasionally active on those full moon nights. What you notice most clearly on those sorts of nights is the, the birds calling. Uh, the Cape turtle doves in particular and the Franklins and in some of the woodlands kingfishers they chirp away all night like they're very confused they keep thinking the sun's coming up and they just chirp away look an antelope <laughs> oh you've grown so much little water buck hard to believe these are, are the same calves that we saw when they were still young and exceptionally fluffy and left all alone. At this point, this little water buck is large enough to keep up with mom, and she no longer hides it, but it keeps it with her. Oh, he <laughs> poked itself in the eye there with a stick. I think waterbuck also one of my favourite antelope to look at. Really good grooming session. Something's caught Mom's attention. 
She's just being extra cautious, especially as they start walking into the drainage line. Her calf is still leopard snack sized. She doesn't want to run the risk of taking it into any dangerous areas without checking first. Aha! We've got calf number two arriving. Oh! <laughs> and they spooked each other. A slightly larger calf. I don't know where the female associated with this baby is. But it's decided in the absence of its mom to follow that herding instinct. Oh, three different sized water buck. Oh, lovely. This one in particular, the one in the front, has got a really fluffy white beard. Really fluffy white chin strap. Uh, and it looks like it's a young male. And that's one of the reasons why it's got the fluffy beard. If you look really carefully, there are the stumps of horns just starting to poke through. I bet he's really proud of them, somehow. Showing them off at all, every possible opportunity. <laughs> oh. Not sure where this young bull's mother is, or if indeed it's the other way around, and this is his mother, and the younger calf is just a hanger on. The rest of the herd might have moved off her. Oh, no, that's definitely the young... That's, the younger calf is definitely hers. You hear the hornbills chirping away? Making an absolute racket. There we go. Doing their morning dance, which consists of rocking backwards and forwards like lunatics. Oh, they've got... There's, there's something about a hornbill's facial expression that really does look... They've got these bright eyes, bright beady eyes, but they just look slightly unhinged, particularly when they're pecking at your windows or when they're doing that rocking announcement to the world that they're here. It's, it's a combination of a, a courting ritual, so between a male and a female, and they are very gregarious birds. They do, you find them in groups together, so it reaffirms the bond, and it also is just part of the dawn chorus. So all the birds announcing to everybody where they are and what they're up to. Bye bye, little water buck. They're a little bit too nervous to move while we're sitting here, so we'll move off and let them decide where they want to go from here. <laughs> Sounds like Brent's having a wonderful time strolling through the drainage line. Oh, he's going to get himself gentle growling at at some point. Let me, yeah. I mean, <laughs> interesting time to pass that question through. <laughs> but, Lael, you were wondering about what happens to us when we get injured, so it's particularly South Africans, particularly South Africans across borders. Um, hopefully we don't have to put this into action with rent, of course. But I do understand what you're asking. Um, most of us have quite considerably robust medical aids as guides, just because Whilst the, you know, you have to get really unlucky to be seriously injured out here, but if an accident does happen, it's likely to result in relatively serious injuries. And a lot of guides do walk, work across borders, which means, again, that having a robust plan in terms of airlifting us out of places and taking us... Our South African private medical care is exceptionally good. It's probably some of the best in the world. Um, so, in terms of, for us, it's worth investing as much money as we can in a health, some kind of health plan. And if something does happen, we will get helicoptered out. But for us, working for Wild Earth, we are connected to a company called Safety. And depending on the severity of any kind of injury, I'm sure, Leo, I don't know if you've heard about the regular drills that we have, where we basically practice first aid. <laughs> where we practice first aid in response to various imagined scenarios. 
By the way, there you go, James. I found you an impala. I will find you a footprint of an impala when the light's a little bit clearer. Yes, we've got lots and lots of plans in place. Um, we're, of course, the, amongst the fortunate in South Africa. Um, a lot of the... A large portion of the population has to make do with governmental medical care, which in certain areas isn't always up to scratch, to put it mildly. So we are the fortunate out here. Little males just starting to grow their horns. And for them, this must be an exceptionally frustrating season, time of year. First of all, every single male that they walk past tries to chase them away. And secondly, they are affected by the hormones that are floating about. So as young males, they, they could, they're physically capable of mating, but they absolutely will not have any kind of opportunity in which to do so. so they just have to deal with the up levels of testosterone plus being chased around basically trying to hide away because they're still so young they have show a great reluctant reluctance to be pushed away from the rest of the herd and the rest of the females at this they're only i mean they're only six months old they want to stay with their moms they're very often chased away by the large rams but we're slowly winding down in terms of the rutting season i don't even, in fact i don't even see a big male associated with this herd he must be here somewhere is he to the right? Ah, here he is. He has not been quite as vigilant as he might have been about a week ago. The rutting season slowly coming to a close. Thanks, Vian. I didn't even see him there. Okay, let's see. If, let's leave our impala. Let's not see if we, what we can find on cheetah cut line. we're not going to do the entire safari in reverse. Okay, let's find you an Impala track. Got lots to say about Impala tracks. Okay. Uh, it sounds as though Shimamalana is on in coral open area. He's been walking through here. Oh no, that's the wrong side for track lighting. Mm, not the greatest tracks out here. And just to let you know what I'm doing and why I'm randomly stopping, I just need to sort some stuff out. I'm going to stay still. Oh, here's Brent's voice. So there we go. Not an antelope track, but it is a bovid track or a ruminant track. Uh, some buffalo tracks for James Richards. I'm trying to see if there's a nice impala track somewhere interposed, but it doesn't look like it. It's just buffalo tracks as far as the eye can see. So many buffalo breeding herds out here. Now just a couple of hundred meters to the east of us sit the Birmingham boys, or most of the Birmingham boys, on a buffalo kill. And hopefully they'll finish it off pretty quickly and decide to come back and join us. This is Torchwood property, uh, the eastern side of our boundary. And if we listen really carefully, actually hear a lion roaring from a little bit further to the north of us. Hmm. It's the wonderful thing about winter is that these chilly winter mornings you get to experience all kinds of things. Oh, we can't go anywhere at the moment. 
So we're going to have a look at the beautiful clouds and the weather and see what else we can find. Oh, okay. We'll start with this. There's a reason why I'm currently sitting in one place. Just waiting for, to find out what's happening. Okay. So, as far as I know, this is Bushman's poison grape. It smells really interesting, actually. It's got a very... What did I call it? it smells like... Mm. It smells like medicine, actually. It does smell like medicine. Now, apparently, if you find yourself with a bee sting, you can actually crush up these leaves and pop them on that particular wound. I cannot remember the Latin name for the life of me. This is called Bushman's Poison Grape. And there's lots of them around. Luckily for me, I no longer have a problem with tick bites and other such things. Winter has come and with it, it provides a tremendous amount of relief from the biting insects of life out here. Right, what else can we find you to talk about? Hmm. <laughs> uh, Betty sleep while we sit quietly here on a cheetah cut line and wait for things to happen around us. You were wondering whether I've ever seen animals that can forecast anything or that can something like heavy storms or any kind of weather or climactic change. Yes, I have. I've seen it happen with elephants before. I was sitting watching elephants in a, in a river. It was a very large river, quite a wide river, and they were all in the reed beds eating the reeds. A big herd, about 30 elephants. And it was cloudy, but the kind of cloud where it's just drizzly every now and again, nothing major was happening. And all of a sudden, there was this rumbling from all of the large females scattered around the group, low rumbling, but urgent. And they took off, I cannot describe to you how fast these elephants ran, up the hill, and out the other side and they disappeared into the trees and as that happened there was this tremendous crack of lightning and booming thunder. Now, I didn't see it hit any of the surrounding trees or whatever was around there but those elephants clearly felt whatever it was whether it was a build-up of electricity or something similar and they shot away from it so quickly so I've definitely seen that in action. Tortoises start to come out just before it rains in summer um, and of course there's the famous story of the animals predicting earthquakes and tidal waves and such things and that I absolutely strongly believe that they are fully capable of doing that. Birds will detect changes in magnetic, female, in magnetic fields and of course the mammals will be able, they've got far better hearing and far better smell than we do and probably better proprioception of what's going on around them. So yes, absolutely, I have seen animals predicting the various climactic conditions. I'm not quite sure what I'm predicting for this morning's weather, however. It seems to be clearing up, but the clouds are also rolling in and starting to get quite cool. And we have a monkey thorn tree, black monkey thorn tree. <laughs> We're going to talk about everything we can see out here. Uh, the black monkey thorn, one of the larger trees out here, very, very similar to the acacia tree, part of the acacia family, which apparently the Australians are now fighting to rename the mimosa family, which we take, so we object strongly to. I'm not sure I'm, I'm fully blaming Australians, just to clarify. It's just that I know that that's where the, the mimosa sort of family is largely present. Yes, actually, Steve in Montana, I have been keeping a measurement or a log of cat tracks. We've got them all recorded somewhere. Um, where are BM's calipers? They're in here somewhere. There they are. Uh, I've been measuring the various cat tracks with VM's calipers. And 
what that does is what we're doing essentially is to try and see if we can identify individual cats by the size of their track. Now, unfortunately, Steve, I haven't had the opportunity to measure Karula's cubs tracks, which is quite disappointing because I was hoping to kind of build up a growth chart, and kind of graph the pattern of their growth, and it would be so cool to compare the male cub to the female cub. We can't do that unless we find them for a start, but also in case or in the situation where we need to be able to see which individual's footprints are where, we might be able to clarify exactly what's coming through. Oh, okay, so we can move again and we're going to send you back across to Brent to see how his lion tracking has been going. So unfortunately those lions have gone into what one can only describe as an impenetrable block. So we're going to move along from there. There's another lion roaring. It sounds like just to the sort of southeast of us. So we're going to head in that direction, see if we can find that lion. Now, that mating pair will, will come out of that river system at some point. So we will definitely be looking for them again a little bit later on this sunrise safari. But I would also keep a close eye on the Juma Dam Cam. Now, they might go there for a drink. It is the closest water to them and their general direction was heading that way. So in the meantime, we're going to go try and find the other lion that's roaring and also give Jamie a chance uh, to get down to Cheetah Plains. Sarah in Ohio has got a very interesting question. She'd like to know what is the difference between a mega pride and a super pride? Well, Sarah, it depends on who's naming them. I'm pretty sure they're about the same thing. Jean, de what have you spotted? No. Uh, and uh, I think it just depends on who's, who's, who's doing the naming. Um, a mega pride or a super pride would just be a pride of lions that is very big. So probably you're looking at at least, I don't know where, where the beginning mark is, but I would say anywhere around 25 or more uh, lions, uh, excluding the dominant coalition members. So I think there, there, there would probably be anything over sort of 20 lions, could be called a mega pride or a super pride. Now the biggest pride I've had the privilege of seeing frequently was uh, called the mega pride by National Geographic. We used to call them the mountain pride and I think at the largest, they got to about 44, 45 lions. Sorry, guys, one second. Standing by. Copy, thanks, next out, we'll do that. Um, that road is Hippo Pools Road. And then the other one is Quarry Pan Road, the one that runs on the drainage. Okay, so the lines that are calling, Lex has found a track, looks like they're heading west, deeper into Juma. So we're gonna go around and check that western road, Quarry Pan Road. So a blue a butter frog would like to know what is the difference between a pride and a coalition. Uh, it's very, very simple. A pride is made up of uh, related females and their young. Whereas a coalition is made up only of males. A uh, coalition, the animals do not need to be related. Uh, whereas with a pride, all the animals will be related. So a coalition is males, sometimes related, sometimes not and a pride is made up of related females and their offspring. That's probably the best way to describe those two things. So 
So, lion roaring was coming from this general area. Uh, we're going to go to this sort of w southwestern side of Gwari Pan Road. And we might, if we don't find any tracks, we might stop and listen for a little bit. Uh, the roaring wasn't full blown roaring, it was more contact calling. So you need to be a bit closer to hear it. The leaning terminalia of Buffles Hook. East Road. So, and now it turns out that the buffalo that was caught last night was a very small one. So, and they've gone to where the kill was and it's finished. That's why there's just lions popping up all over the place. So Ellen in Arkansas would like a refresher. Well, Ellen, my pleasure to give you a refresher. Talking about the different mating dynamics and cub dynamics between leopards and lions. So uh, we'll start with lions because we've seen them this morning. So male lions in a coalition, and in, in this stage there are four male lions in the Birmingham coalition, uh, will mate with multiple females. The females will also mate with multiple male members of the coalition. Generally, females will initiate uh, the, the mating process, but the male lions are far, far more wired to, to, to mate than, say, a, a male leopard. So they will actively, once they hear sort of a female contact calling or smell any sign of estrus, they will actively search out that female and follow her around while they mate. Now, leopards, it's the opposite. The females actively look for, for the males and follow the males around while they mate. Uh, it's very unusual for a lioness to move out of her, her territory to mate. Uh, she'll normally always mate in her territory. It is very normal for a leopard to move out of territory to mate. Uh, that's one of the two differences there. When it comes to cubs, Lions are, are cooperative breeders, so if they're multiple females that have cubs at the same time, they will suckle each other's young. Now they're all related, so it's their genetics that are being passed on, so it's beneficial for everyone. When it comes to the birth of cubs, it's, it's quite s similar. Uh, that the fact the female will find a secluded cave, thicket, little drainage system uh, to give birth to the, the cubs with. Now, both of them will do that. Of course, lions will then, after about a month or so, introduce the cubs to the rest of the pride. Whereas leopards, of course, are, are, are far more solitary and will keep their cubs, generally try to keep their cubs hidden from males and females, even males that they've mated with. The reason female leopards will mate with multiple males and move out of territory is to ensure that any male leopard that might come upon their cubs thinks that they're the father. They might not necessarily be, but they have definitely mated with that female. So it's a strategy to help uh, curb cub mortality. Now, most leopard cubs are killed by other male leopards, and most lion cubs are killed by other male lions. So it's not hyenas and, and other species that do a lot of the killing of cubs, although they will if they come across the cubs. It's generally an, uh, another male from the same species that will do, do the killing. And that's about the main difference. So females, lions never leave their territory by mating. The males follow them around. Leopards, the females will often leave their territory for mating and follow the males around. Uh, both will mate with multiple males. Now with lions, quite interestingly, uh, there's been quite a lot of genetic research done on certain lion populations in the last 10 or 15 years. So one normally always assumes that the cubs born to a pride that has got a dominant coalition like the Birmingham's like we have here 
are definitely the children of the Birminghams. Now, in certain cases and, and in areas with good lion populations like this, there's been found that up to 50% of the cubs born are not born to the pride males. Now, this is very interesting. So there are male lions that never join coalitions and never actually hold a territory that has multiple prides in it. Uh, these guys are some little sneaky and their survival strategy and their, their, their strategy to pass on their genetic information is to literally sneak around the peripheries. And the lionesses will mate with these males. And quite often they're very big, beautiful males. They're not in a coalition, so they can't fight to hold the territory. So they sneak around the edges and will mate with these females. But as soon as one of the dominant males arrives, they'll move away. But there, there, there is quite a lot of, of that that happens. So, I mean, in Itosha National Park in Namibia, the, the research shows that 49% of all cubs born are not related to the pride males. There's been a lot more genetic studies done on, on lions than on leopard. And that's why this Panthera study at the moment is so, so interesting. Now, it's being used for multiple reasons. One is uh, the genetics, which is more of a, a side project, a science side project. The main thing is also genetics, but it's to see uh, where the illegal trade in skins comes from. So if you've got a data bank of leopard genetics from all over Africa, you can find out when you confiscate illegal skins or, or whatnot where they're coming from and that's also to help conservation and, and help find target areas where they need to step up on the conservation of, of, of leopards okay so we're now on Gwari Pan Road and we're checking for the tracks Chris is wondering, do dominant male lions only mark the edge of their, their territory or do they mark inside as well? They mark everywhere, Chris, inside, outside. There you go, we've got a lion track here, but it's old, been driven over. And we're the first car driving this road this morning, so that is not from today. very carefully while I scan the road for tracks and genres. It's supposed to be checking in the bush. I oh, know it's a stump. Sorry about that. Uh, I was about to chastise Jandre heavily for not looking. Lex is coming from the other side. Now, just got to check very, very carefully. What we're going to do is we're going to get down to that little corner here, and there's a major animal park that runs west or southwest. And if we find no tracks there, we might sit and listen for a little bit, see if we can hear anything. slowly, very, very slowly checking through here. Now, apparently there's also a herd of buffalo not too far from here. So, maybe the other lions are more interested in getting more, more of a meal than a, 
than the honeymoon phase that the two we saw first thing this morning were. So, just chatting about lions mating. They'll normally mate for four or five days, uh, every 15 minutes, and they do very little hunting. They might, they might hunt, they're opportunists, but generally the focus is on procreation during that period. You can see we're going very, very slowly now we're in this area. The ground's a bit hard here, so we don't want to miss a track. Okay, while we're checking for these lion tracks, James Richard is wondering, would I consider setting up my camera trap again? Most definitely, but first things first, I'm getting a hyena-proof steel box made for it. So you guys, just need to be on the radio. Standing by. He's going to have a quick morning meeting with Lex. He's also looking for the same lions. Morning, morning. That's oh, good. Good, good. Uh, yeah, so the last checks on Hippo Pools Road. Looks like they've been lying around there. And then I couldn't work out. It's a little circular going yeah. around. That's the last check. There's no tracks here. There's some old, old tracks. They've been driven over there, so I think they must be still there. I might go back up there and just take a quick walk. Yeah, I think he's in this area. Well, good luck. Hopefully okay. we'll see you over a line a little later. Good luck. Cheers. Cheers. Oops. Oh. oh, God. There we go. So no tracks coming out there. We've got no tracks coming out there, so it's very likely that that lion is still sleeping or lying about in this block here. Might be worth taking a little stroll in a while. Let's have a look. We've got a kudu, not barking. It is looking into the block. So if it spots a line, we're going to hear that deep bow. There you go, female kudu. Testing the wind, you can see how those ears. I like radar dishes picking up any sound. Browsing off a monkey orange. And while we sit with the kudu, you can take the opportunity to listen a little bit. It's quite often your ears that find the animals way before your eyes. See what I mean? I can hear guinea fowl alarm calling. Sounds like on Hippo Pools Road, so let's move around to there. So lots of different animals will alarm at a lion. So not, whoopsie, there's a little bit of a hole there. Not only kudu and, and impala and nyala, but also birds. So those guinea fowl sound upset and they sound about right where Lex was talking about where the tracks went off the road. So let's scuttle up there. Still checking carefully in case he is on the move. But it's nice to have lions back on the property. Now, uh, hopefully, Jamie can just pull a leopard out of the bag. And uh, Saturday Cat Day is back in full flight.
we do have some tracks yet. Oh. Ah. Oh. There we go. Just right, yeah. Uh, copy, thanks, Elvis. Uh, may I join you? I'm at Quarry Pan. So I just saw his tracks and he's just been spotted around the corner. So, John, I'll get to your question in a second. I was confirm on Drakensberg, right? Then Vela that comes from Chitakat line. This is the road he's talking about. We will see shortly. But uh, so those tracks just went across there, heading a little bit further, sort of south. I'm hoping we're on the right track. Ah, there we go. We were. So, is he on the move, is the question. It must be, since Elvis is dashing off into the bushes. Oh, there he is. No, he's having a little, a little schnooze. Uh, how was that for you there, Jean-Dre? I'll try to get around in front of him now. Let's just, there we go. I'll move, you know. There we go. Just wait for Elvis to get into position and then we'll move around. gap that you think we yeah, you can shoot through genre. I'll reverse for you now. How's that? Is it Okay, let's have a look. Oh he's about to call. Big belly. He does have a little bit of a limp, but that's not unusual for male lions. Hello. So that's three of the four Birmingham's accounted for at the moment. Uh, not sure where the fourth guy is. So there's one. Mating of Gauri Kaplan, there's one mating of Fox Book with I mean in Torture, there's another in Kahuma Lioness, and then there's
what's in here. It's still that soft roaring, it's not roaring properly. Mm. Elvis is Kuluma. Just now, we're just gonna let the other vehicles move into position. So it's not a full move, it's a more of a little contact roll. Uh, he's probably trying to check where the other coalition members are, but they're not gonna tell him because they've got girlfriends at the moment. And of course, if he might be a little bit more dominant than them, it's a bit of a problem because they might fight over the mating rights. And you probably find he might be holding this injury from fighting for mating. making sure other male lions don't get hold of you. And then once you're big enough, strong enough, you've got to go chase some other male lions for your spot in the sun. And then for the rest, you have to try and defend it. And then when it comes to mating, you end up fighting with, with your other coalition members to get the best mating rights. So it is, a, it is a tough life at the top. And that's why they don't live very long out in the wild. There we go, there he is. So if he does roar, we're in the right spot, and the sound will be coming directly towards us. Sorry, we're just trying to move it. There we go. How's that? Had to move a cable quickly for there. So hopefully he opens his eyes and gives you the chance at some nice screenshots. As a final control just mentioned it looks like he's perfectly framed by those two uh, weeping wattles there Oh, it's a tired kitty. Well, a happy kitty, a full kitty. He did get to eat a buffalo last night, even though it wasn't the biggest one. That lovely light coming through from behind.
It's amazing how these male lions, since we first started seeing them, how their manes have developed. Now, of course, a male lion's mane is actually quite an important thing in his life. So it's not there as decoration. Uh, Ur Gag says it's salon quality. Um, but it is there because they fight so much. It's there to protect the vulnerable neck area. So that mass of hair there is a very good defense system when they're fighting. He's giving his poor little lick at the moment. And of course, jean -Dre has pointed this out to me a few times this morning. So I said, oh, those lions that killed the buffalo last night. The last thing we're going to see today is lions. And then the only thing we've seen today is, is lions. So uh, I'm quite happy to be proven wrong in these circumstances. Now, we saw he was limping. I wonder if he's licking an injury on in his front paw. For me, when it moved, it looked like his injury was more in the back. The back left-hand side would be my guess. But till he moves again, we're not going to be able to see. But you guys might have seen a gash on his front paw, according to Final Control. Uh, so that's what he could be licking. He could be licking that injury. Now, the amazing thing about lions and how resilient they are, he's licking a gash with that very, very dirty mouth of his. Lots of rotting bits of meat and things. Now, if a lion had to lick, lick a gash on us, it would probably get heavily, heavily infected. Hey, big boy. He's sniffing the air now. Oh, that looks like a nice picture. So I'm going to grab a photograph. I suggest you guys do the same. Get a screenshot. Share it on the Safari Live Facebook page or pop it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. As it gets warmer during the day, it's unlikely he's going to move too far from where he is at the moment. So we might. We're well, definitely going to stay here for a bit longer, see if he calls or we've done something entertaining. Other than that, I think we're definitely going to have to go have another look for that mating pair around Gauri Cutline. Hopefully they might have come out of the thick drainage system. So where he's looking now, there is another Birmingham mating with uh, Ninkuma lioness inside Torchwood. So it's possible that he's been listening to them and it's possible his injury came from fighting for mating rights. Oh, no that. He's gone back. This is a doo-doo lion. He must feel, he looks like some, I'm sure some of our viewers feel being up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning to join us on the live safaris. We really do appreciate your dedication. part of a coalition of four male lions. Lady Lone Wolf would like to know whether he'll be attacked if he's injured. Not necessarily, and only if he decided to fight for mating rights with one of the other coalition members. It's unlikely he's going to be attacked by another group of male lions. He's right in the core part of their territory. And even though it looks like he's limping, could also just be the early morning cold and if he had to walk for a while, that injury would unstiffen and he'd still be a very formidable force. You would not want to tangle with this boy.
So Rame is wondering, would this male lion patrol territory by himself? So Rame, most definitely. Now, coalition members, one of the, the joys of being in a big male lion coalition is that you're able to firstly dominate a much larger area than a one or two male lion coalition would do. Secondly, you can move independently of each other. So they can mark and patrol different areas. If trouble arises, buddies are only a, a little roar away. And that'll definitely bring the other members of the coalition into that area to help him defend it. If there's a lot of male lions chasing him, he might roar, but still keep trying to move and generally move closer to where the other coalition members might be coming from. But they do meet up quite often and they will sometimes patrol together or sometimes two at a time or three or four or all, all four. It just depends on what's going on around. So for them, they do a lot of roaring in the south and they got a lot of roaring in the east and occasionally a lot of roaring in the north. So those are the three areas where they have potential other male lions moving into their territory. So depending on whether the male lions from the north, east or south are around, depends on where they focus their attentions. When there's no apparent threat, they can be found anywhere, either with the females, by themselves. And, but if they hear a, a pride of females catch a, a meal, they run towards it to get a freebie. But there's a big misconception that male lions don't hunt. They are actually very good hunters. They generally hunt bigger things. And patrolling territory, they spend a lot of time away from the females. So they do hunt, and they hunt big things like buffalo, and hippo, giraffe. So they are very capable hunters. But being a male lion and being the king of the pride, if there's a free meal to be had, they will definitely take advantage of it. Let's try you a little bit closer to this big boy. Um, Sarah. <laughs> is asking, she said, this question might be silly. It's not at all, Sarah. She said, but do lions get hairballs? They most certainly do. And very large, very smelly hairballs. Quite often, you'll find bits of um, bone and hoof in those hairballs as well. Unfortunately, there's one little stick through his, in the middle of his face. Uh, let's just try a little bit further forward, maybe. We might get a bit of view. Okay, let's try that one, Jean-Ré. Try that angle. So, Rita from Joburg said, Brent, jump out and move the stick. It's ruining my screenshot. Well, there we go, Rita. A different stick, but not across the center of his face, so maybe slightly better for your screenshot. So lions are sometimes called lazy. And so they're not lazy, they're just very, very economical with their movements, I suppose is a better way of describing it. And they will generally rest for an average of about 20 hours out of 24. Now, they have quite a big problem in dealing with heat. So they don't tend to move too much when it's hot and they tend to rest up. Now, especially since he's got quite a full belly of buffalo, it means he's unlikely to do too much moving today. And he's probably going to do exactly what he's just done now. He's gonna sleep. The only movement he'll do today is to move into the shade as the sun moves around. And uh, he might get moving this evening might head for a drink somewhere. There's water relatively close by at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Now, lions will drink when they have the option of drinking. They don't necessarily need to drink, though. They are, can get enough moisture from the prey they eat from the blood, but if there's water available, they will take advantage of it. I 
and the thousand yard stare. There's nothing quite like a lion when he looks at you. It almost looks like he sees straight through you. And of course now he closes his eyes. Oh, look at that. You can see there's a little tick on his left eye there, just below. It looks like a bond tick. Just from the color, it's yellowish. Some spots on it. Here's a bond tick. Oh, there are those eyes. Isn't that exquisite? Hopefully you guys are getting some screenshots of this big boy's beautiful eyes. Looks like he's fighting to stay awake. And you can see the different crisscross of small scars on his muzzle and on his nose. And not only do they fight the other coalition members for mating rights, but also for food. Uh, lions can be very loving when there's no ladies food around but when both those are around they can be extremely aggressive with each other now from a photography point of view you can very often very easily see the difference between a wild lion and a captive bred lion in photographs so if we look at a captive bred lion he hasn't had the hard life that these wild lions have and there are very few scratches and marks and dings on their body and almost certainly very few ticks around the eyes. Uh, I think that's what he's going to do for the rest of the morning. So I'm hoping that that mating pair might have moved out of the thickets. So we're going to start meandering down towards that area again, and hopefully we get some luck. And the nice thing about mating lions is they are, don't sleep for the full 20 hours, and they mate every 15 minutes. So definitely worth our while going to have a look in that area. Goodbye, mister. Have a nice snooze. said what a beautiful shot of his eyes and she's wondering do we ever get we go um blue-eyed lions the only blue-eyed lions you're going to find direz are when they're cubs but they lose that quite quickly so adult lions i've never seen a blue-eyed adult lion um so i would say probably not uh, but when they are cubs they do have blue eyes. Just got a call on the fact that I'm leaving that male line. Let's get a gap on the radio quickly. Leaving that one one Nangara lying up on Drakensberg Road, probably about halfway between Central and Quarry Pan. Open lock. So, lions, lions everywhere. And hopefully we will be able to catch up with the mating pair. Oh, I'm rhyming this morning. That's normally genre is forte. Still quite chilly, but 
definitely nice to have the sun on our backs warming us up slightly. The really nice thing about these cold winter mornings is we do find cats on the move more often. Sorry, just listen to the game drive quickly here. Let's see, taxi is trying to find. Okay, so we've got a bit more of a fun question from Dr. Debbie. Uh, Dr. Debbie said, the question is, um, if I needed first aid, who is the um, first person I would let do first aid on me and who is the last? Jandre is putting his hand up and he's definitely not the first person I'd let do first aid. He's going, giving me a sad face. I'd say there's probably three people um, I would let do first aid first. Uh, and that would be either James, Steph, or Jamie. Uh, the biggest problem I think I'd have is, is I'd probably do most of the first aid on myself. Uh, so, and in terms of who is the last person I'd let do first aid on me, I'm, I'm not going to sink anyone out, uh, out in the open, but they know who they are. They've already killed me once in a, in a drill. <laughs> I didn't make I didn't make our snake bite drill, but uh, they, we do do first aid training quite regularly, and we will be doing some more. So, in their defence, they haven't done nearly as much first aid as the rest of us. So, living out in the bush, we've oof, been doing first aid courses for a long time. I did a, a British uh, military first aid course uh, while I was in Tanzania, and learned a lot on that one. And then I've done multiple first aid courses since then. So, but I think the one I learned the most on was the, the military, emergency military first aid course. I'm quite good at stitches as well. I've even stitched myself up. Fingers crossed that the breeding lions have moved out of the drainage line and will give us some spectacular shots. Our first plan is to check along the southern side, central, make sure they haven't popped out there, and we'll check back along Gari Cut Line and then around to Hyena. Road. We might stop and listen for a little bit, see if we can find them with our ears to listen to the most noisy affair. to decide whether to put my gloves back on or not. It got warm, but now every time that the, the sun pops behind a cloud, it gets chilly again. Now, Emily is wondering where I found my other mitt. Well, very strangely, with all my shoes. I don't know quite how it got there, but it was at the bottom of the cupboard where all the shoes were. Jamie actually found it, I can't lie, I didn't find it. 
uh, Jamie did. She knew where it was. I was quite confused. I'm still not sure how one stayed in my case and the other went to live with my boots. So I think there's a very strong likelihood that, if not during the day, definitely over this evening, that, that mating pair of lions will pop up on the Juma Dam Cam at some point. So keep your eyes open, Dam Cam peeps. So unfortunately, Jamie has uh, discovered some uh, gremlins and uh, Connor and co Eugene and co, the tech department, are trying to fix it. Uh, she has uh, had to head back to camp and they're busy trying to fix those tech issues at the moment. Hopefully she'll be out shortly, uh, but till then, unfortunately, you're stuck with me. Now, look what we have here, a breeding herd of buffalo. There are lions right here, guys, be careful. So it looks like, difficult to say how big a herd, and I think a lot of the herds have been split overnight with the lions chasing them. Clumbe of Nyari, on Central at Giraffe Crossing. There you go, young male. Horns haven't started widening too much just yet. Now, where we saw those, that mating pair of lines was no more than about 600, 700 meters from here. So, being the opportunist that they are, possible that they might get sidetracked and try to catch a buffalo. You never know. And also for the damn cam guys, I think this herd of buffalo is probably going to head towards there as well. And we have seen some incredible lion and buffalo interaction around uh, Vuyatela. You can see the buffalo, you can hear them snorting out there. They're not that comfortable. And that's, there we go, yeah, that, and move off. That's to be expected if you got harassed by lions last night. <laughs> Hello, big boy. There's a big dominant bull giving us the you owe me money stare. Could definitely imagine buffalo being the debt collectors of the bush. A formidable animal. Way around 500 kilograms, a big bull. Sometimes as heavy as 750 for a really big bull. And it can put up quite a tussle, even with lions. So if these buffalo continue heading in the direction they are, they might bump into those lions. But I'm going to go try to find the lions. While we try to do that, it seems like Jamie is up and about again. So let's go see what she's got. Well, it's been quite an interesting morning, has it not? <laughs> We've had various signal issues, just to, I'm sure Brent has explained, that that Gauri repeated has gone down and isn't doing terribly well. But we have raced across to Arethusa. And Connor is currently working furiously, and look who we've encountered. It's our slightly strange giraffe from yesterday. Now, if you missed the sunset safari, we found this trio of giraffe, a group of two females 
and one sub-adult male who is currently looking off intently to the west and now looking at us and they were behaving in the most peculiar manner now let's reposition slightly just because i'm sure we can get a slightly better view they are nice and relaxed around vehicles so yesterday this strange trio were galloping around playing i can only assume that they were playing the hormones maybe playing a slight role in whatever was going on but they were galloping around the female was kicking the male the male was kind of half touching her with his front legs almost like a courting ritual but not quite he's quite bold this little gentleman a boy it's okay i'm coming to i'm coming to get you and then the end result was after they'd chased themselves across in parlor plains they then gathered around one spot and proceeded to stick their heads right down towards the ground like they were having a drink but just to sniff the soil around that area at first i thought they were going to go for bones that they were going to pick up a bone or something like that they didn't and all three of them repeated that ritual here we go ox pickers look at that perfectly synchronized or almost perfectly synchronized combing motions from the ox pickers sifting through the fur they seem to have calmed down a little bit though none of the shenanigans that we saw yesterday and we were treated to such a special sighting because they were full-on galloping it's not often that we get to see a giraffe running at full tilt with that very strange, graceful, I suppose, rocking motion. It covers ground tremendously quickly. This gives us a perfect opportunity to see the stiffened tail feathers at work of an ox pecker. Oh, that's a lovely beard you've got going on there, girl. Those slightly thinner ossicones. Ah, I wish she'd stuck her tongue out for us yesterday. <laughs> the school was asking about whether or not it's true that giraffe have purple tongues. Yes, of course it is. Darkened with melanin to toughen them up. All right, let's go back a little bit. I want to have a look at that male again. Just such a nice opportunity for us to compare the male versus the female because he's not he's not huge and he's not tall and dark and mature like the bull that we saw earlier he's about the same height as the two females what that means is we can really see the physical the anatomical differences starting to develop without the giveaway being the dark oh no <laughs> i think we should just go home <laughs> VM's camera's just fallen apart. <laughs> Prince has gone for a walk. <laughs> you know when you just have one of those mornings? This is not the way I was planning on my Saturday morning going at all. VM, would you like to fix your camera quickly or shall we, can we fix it? <laughs> it's um it has gently fallen apart. <laughs> the lens cover has gone for a walk. Okay, we've managed to relocate it. <laughs> right, what else, what else should go wrong? We, should we take our pick? Is our signal going to drop? We suddenly bounce up a delay for a few seconds. Um, hmm, what else could possibly happen this morning? Oh, Wendy might catch a light. It wouldn't be the first time. I hope not though. Let's not go that far, please. I don't think, I don't think I can take much more this morning. Luckily for all of the viewers, the crew of Wild Earth are pressure-driven people. It wouldn't, just wouldn't be working in the bush if things didn't go wrong every now and again. And of course for us, with all of our technology involved, when things go wrong, they can go wrong in quite spectacular style. Hi Giraffe. You don't have to have such concerns on your Saturday morning, do you? Nope. Top priority is which leaf is going to taste the best. Those ones, apparently, right down there. 
Generally, females have an, an average of a lower feeding height than a male. It's more common to see the females bending down like that to eat. And that's of course because a giraffe's long neck, evolutionary wise, contrary to the theories that we've all grown up understanding, a giraffe's long neck is now thought not to be to provide a feeding height advantage, but it's actually a reproductive strategy. Like the Diplodocus and the Brachiosaurus of the dinosaurs, it's thought that it's a it's a basically a fighting mechanism that the male giraffe evolved. You know how they fight by swinging their heads to the side and hitting each other on the sides of the body. Well, the longer a giraffe's neck was, the more effective that swing was because obviously the greater the momentum gathered. And thus the genes started selecting for long necks. A less to do with feeding height, particularly clearly now, giraffe not making full use of her long stretched neck and more to do with a fighting stance. Yeah. Now, an interesting aspect of the changing way in which our understanding evolves as we learn more and more about the animals we see around us. All right. Well, the three of you seem far better behaved than you were yesterday, obviously run out the hijinks. Now relaxed a little bit and just enjoying a nice and sedate Saturday morning breakfast. Ah, aha, the monitor has disappeared. That's okay. Half of the course. <laughs> On we go. <laughs> it gets to the stage where one does really just have to have a good laugh. Let's go see what's happening at Red Dam. Maybe the Mungani Pride has decided to come back and join us there. Good morning, Impala. Oh, feeling a bit lazy this morning, are we? Oh, there's the big ram settling down. relatively relaxed and perfectly at peace. We have a very interesting question from Ergag, which is basically Ergag, is that right? Is <laughs> essentially why are the animals so relaxed with our presence on the vehicle and yet if we were to get out and walk around they would be the first to dash off and the Impala would be a perfect example of this. If I were to get out of the car now and walk towards them they would be on their way very rapidly. The answer lies in instinctive responses to our shape. We are, to them, on our two legs, hundreds of thousands of years worth of evolution that says, uh-oh, that thing is going to hunt me. And the same reason why they alarm call when they see a lion or a leopard, particularly displaying predatory behavior, which we do automatically through instinct when we walk on two legs. But and cars or vehicles driving around this area have only been around for the last hmm, 100 or so years. That's pushing it. Let's say the last 70. The first civilian driven game drives around the Kruger National Park would have been around the 1930s. That's when most of the cars started arriving. So you don't have that evolutionary instinct that says that vehicles are dangerous. Now there's a lot of people that will tell you that the Impala, when they look at us now in the vehicle, are seeing only the shape of the vehicle and that they don't identify individual people within it. To me, that's not true. I have seen animals ev of every species, oh, being herded by the male. Shame, Paul is having a rough time of it at the moment. I have seen every single animal out here look at me as an individual person. They know that people are on the back. It's just that they don't have that instinct because for the most part they are not hunted from vehicles, certainly not in this area, and their ancestors haven't been either. Uh, they've become accustomed to vehicles. They've, of course, every single animal that we see in the Sabi Sands has grown up with vehicles driving around it. Oh, big stretch there. And thus there is no need to feel afraid of us. And we're so fortunate and it is so essential. It's a, and it doesn't, it's not the same everywhere. 
That is why we're so lucky to be here on the Sabi Sands, because the animals have been treated with respect for many, many years. And there's a great culture of ethical tourism out here. And what that means is that, in turn, they have become nice and relaxed around vehicles, which is essentially one of the basic parts of, or basic principles of conservation. Because the more relaxed the animals, the more the tourists want to come and see them, and the more the tourists bring money that can then be put towards conservation of the future of this area and the animals themselves. So the habituation process is one that is absolutely essential. But every now and again, you will see, we will find an, anim an animal, whether it be an elephant or a buffalo or a leopard, Gijima, for example, that has spent less time with vehicles and is in fact very nervous. And it's all a part of not taking it for granted. So every time we drive up to an animal sighting, yes, if we know the animal, we, we know how to approach it, but at the same time, something might be happening in that animal's day that we don't know about. So it's all a very gradual process of reading an animal's body language when you approach it. And now the impala have decided they want to cross the road, just as I was about to start up and start heading forward. Oh, Ellie's trumpeting somewhere off in the distance. Oh, Joey, you were wondering, do Impala alarm call on the subject of them responding to people on foot? Do they alarm call or do they just run like they would do from a wild dog pack? Depends on the Impala herd. I've walked some impala herds that have seen me coming, they're comfortable, I'm not displaying predatory behaviour, I'm walking around the side, not in a direct way to them, at which point they don't do anything except stop and watch you. If you're close to them, a lot of the time they will run, like the other day when we surprised them on bushwalk and they immediately bolted off without a single sound. If you're a little bit further away, or depending on the impala herd and how used to seeing people on foot they are, then yes, they will alarm call. And I have had my position given away by, by impala before. Sorry, just listening to its crashing sounds in the back. Oh, oh, poor dog. Poor dog panic. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> and now? What's got into you? <laughs> I think they've been unsettled. Herbert tells me Herbert's come to join us on our game drive. He tells me that he thinks that he is a. Oh, there is a car coming. Good morning. Let me just shift off the road. I must tell you, remind me to tell you something about it. that Herbert taught me. How's it, man? Good How are you? Good morning. Good, thanks. Good just cruising. Get a go to Red Dam, see what we can find there. Yeah. We've had a, a highly successful morning. Fantastic. We really haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Right. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, just go uh, Martin Drive. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Have Good a great morning. Bye, guys. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just chatting to one of the Elephant Plains guides. Hmm. James, did Brent ever show you an Impala track? Or did he not? Did he not get around to that? Here we go. Oh, yes, I'll tell you my Herbert story in a moment. But first of all, We've got some Impala tracks in the road. And I'm going to jump out for a second. Hopefully there's nobody else coming. And the Impala have moved off, so I'm not going to scare them away. So, James, there are your Impala tracks for you. Oh, I'm about to catch my cables on the side of the car door. That would just be the crowning glory. I think just to top off the day. <laughs> Let's get you a sense of scale, first of all, for our Impala tracks. And I actually really want to talk about this one, VM. I don't know how clearly you can see it. Perfect, thank you. So, sense of scale, it's about the size... Oh, they're alarm calling at me. Impala's alarm calling at me, but not fully. So it's about the size from the top of my finger to around just below the middle of my joint. But what really sets an Impala track apart from most of the other antelope is that they are what's known as rim walkers. What that means is that the outside edge of their hooves are quite extended, more so than the rest of their track. 
So it creates these deep lines on the outside and then quite a, a mound of sand in the middle. Very sharp, very pointed track with quite a nice neat little heart bend at the end. I know the, the light is not ideal. Yes, okay, hello. Here we go, we have an answer to the question about alarm calling on foot. I'm also now crouched down, which is also predatory behavior because I haven't presented myself to them, so they think I'm trying to sneak up on them. And so they're all bah, 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 barking at me. Now as I stand up, they skitter a little bit and then they relax because I'm not walking straight towards them. And obviously I'm not gonna try and prove a point by walking at them, trying to deliberately scare them. I don't want to do that. <clears throat> but there you go, Joey, an answer to your question about alarm calls. Okay, so we've done the Impala track. Now, to my Herbert story, as we head to Red Dam. We talked a little bit, I should have actually explained what happened earlier, where I stopped dead on Cheetah Cut Line and couldn't move. And that was when Gowrie... That was when Gowrie Repeater went down and I only had signal on one of our masts, but it wasn't very stable. Brent wasn't, um, Brent didn't have, I can't remember if he was off the vehicle or he didn't have signal. Either way, we couldn't get to him. And for us, when the signal gets a little bit weak, it's better if we stop and chat about stuff. And it happened at that exact moment, so I had to stop and sit for five minutes and chat to you about some stuff. Otherwise, we would have ended up you would have ended up watching our tech loop, which we wanted to avoid. So that is why I was sitting where I was, um, just chatting a little bit for those five minutes in the middle of the show. And we spoke about the Bushman's grape. Picked up that plant, I said she's got quite a medicinal smell. Now Herbert tells me in addition to using it for bee stings, if you dig up the roots and you boil them up with either magic guari or natal guari or both, it's apparently used as quite an effective treatment for STIs, so sexually transmitted infections or diseases, as well as a treatment for bilharzia, and basically as a, as a blood cleanser. So I'll have a look at what chemical properties it has, but there's a little bit more information about the Bushman's grape that we stopped at earlier. It's wonderful to have Herbert joining our team. Oh. Good neck click happening there. Now apparently there is a huge breeding herd of buffalo slowly making its way towards the Arethusa Dam. So for those of you, we won't get there in time for the end of the sunrise safari, but for those of you who keep track of our dam cameras after the show, keep your eye out at the Arethusa Dam, because there's a good chance that about a thousand buffalo are going to make their way there at some point in the next few hours to go and have a drink. And of course, as always, whenever we see a herd of buffalo, it brings renewed hope of lions wandering along behind them. Apparently the Mangen Pride is on Simbambili at the moment, so they've crossed back from where they were on Sydney's Dam and headed back towards... It's been interesting how they've pushed further and further north from their usual spot around Londonosi. It was so exciting to see a new pride of lions for us the other day. Remains to be seen, though, where they're going to settle and what they're going to do with themselves. you who are rushing to send questions through just to let you know that every now and again I am struggling to hear names and so on so if I butcher your, your username or I don't quite get it right that's why a little bit crackly 
<laughs> because it just wouldn't be true to form this morning if things came through clearly. Ah, Nigel, I definitely heard that name. <laughs> Nigel, on the subject of things going according to plan, Nigel, watching in the UK, would like to know if I've ever been stranded in the middle of a bush. Multiple times. The one that immediately springs to mind was many years ago where the reserve that I used to work at struggled to afford, this was many years ago, um, struggled to afford anti-poaching fees and as such didn't have a, an anti, things have changed but as such didn't have an anti-poaching team on the ground and on full moon nights we used to go out and basically I mean I'm not a trained anti-poacher but I basically used to just drive around with a bright light flashing and just as to act as a deterrent more than anything else. Well, this was during, not during our drought, but during the year of the great rains. So the roads were positively sludge. And I was driving along the fence line about as far as I could have got from anywhere. My radio wasn't working. Hello, Ellie. And my, neither apparently was my four wheel drive because we went through a patch of mud and we just didn't come out the other side. And so for the next two hours in the pitch dark, I dug and dug and dug in some very thick mud and basically got nowhere and couldn't get hold of anyone. There was no phone signal. There was no radio signal. Eventually somebody decided that I probably should have been home by now and came looking for me. And I was very kindly pulled out of the mud wallow that I was in, covered in fetid mud, it was stinky mud, and thus ended the great saga of me being stranded. Okay, so it was only for a few hours, but it was midwinter. Hello, Amy. This is going to be tricky because she's about to go into the drainage line. been something of an elephant themed morning this morning. Slightly difficult angle. That's amazing. Thank you to Dave in Toronto. This morning we had a question through about the size of an elephant's lung and a question that I had absolutely no idea what the answer was. But Dave's just sent through information saying that an elephant will breathe in about 310 litres of air per minute compared to us where we breathe in about 7 to 8. And that's absolutely phenomenal. I mean it makes sense they're such large animals. But I'd love to know about the, the actual physics behind their their hemoglobin and their heart and their lungs and their, actually their whole pulmonary circulatory system must be absolutely incredible to be able to function in that way. And then of course so much of that blood that's then oxygenated <coughs> sent through into the cooling system, the great cooling system that is their air, that is their air, their ears, Goodness. not their air, that doesn't make any sense, so their ears. Oh. All right, everybody, bumpy, bumpy. I will always fondly remember this drainage line that we've just gone through around Red Dam as the place where we were treated to an extraordinary sighting with Tingana and Karula mating. Let's see if the rest of the elephant herd isn't through here. Amazing watching the areas that the I elephants can traverse. Hmm? Not a tail that's mm. Oh wow! Look at that. <laughs> well, here's a here's a symphony on a theme. And another eddy without a tail. And there you go. Two in one day, and I've hardly ever seen them. 
It's a much younger Ellie than the elephant bull that we saw earlier. Well spotted, Vim. Well, it's interesting that tailless Ellie, a slightly slight stump to him. But to continue on another theme that we were talking about, Grey Ghost, you would like to know why some of the Ellies look like they are crying. And the answer is their eyes are watering a great deal at the moment. So are mine, so are Viam's. We're both sneezing every now and again. There's just so much dust and it's going to continue on as we go into deeper into winter and our dry season. And for them, especially when they dust bathe, they sometimes get quite a lot of dirt and dust in their eyes and it makes them water. And there's a lot of them I've noticed over the last few days have got watery eyes and lots and lots of that white waxy buildup around the corner of their eyes as well. Then of course there's the way that elephants really do cry, not in really in the human sense, but sort of. And that is when they secrete, they show emotions through secreting from their temporal glands, so between their eyes and their ears, which She's a very, oh, watch the way she comes down here. Just fascinating to watch them navigate these obstacles. You, are, you guys are unfamiliar, having never walked there, of course, but that is a very steep drainage line wall that she just wandered down. It's important to remember that anywhere a human being can go on two legs, an elephant can go on four. So unless you'd have to resort to climbing to get somewhere, an elephant could go there too. And I've found elephant dung in the most bizarre of places. Tops of copies, tops of mountains. I was hoping there'd be more of them, but it seems as though she's lagged behind the rest of the herd, or she is all on her own with her baby. Let's try and do a loop while we do. Debbie, you were wondering if an elephant tusk will ever get a cavity or decay in the same way that human teeth do. And yes, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Although the elephant tusks are very, very tough, as you can imagine, I mean, they, they sit outside of the elephant's mouth, there is exactly the same root system an even deeper root system than we have that extends into their faces. And every now and again, whether it's through some, you know how some human beings have weaker teeth than others, sometimes they crack more easily. Um, every now and again an elephant is born with a defect that either the tusk splits and heals up quite nicely, or they get really serious, really uncomfortable abscesses. And that can happen if they fight and they crack a tusk as well. And apparently there's a lot of grumpy elephants, unhappy elephants that very often charge cars are thought to have really nasty abscesses in their teeth, which in their tusks, which must hurt. And those of you who have experienced toothache, you know how incredibly debilitating that pain is. It radiates up into your head. You can't think straight. And just imagine being an elephant, so now you've got the weight of the tusk hanging on there. And unfortunately, in other situations, not here, but in certain situations, that can result in the death of the elephant, for either through infection or through the fact that the elephant becomes so aggressive that authorities act to, they, they don't realize what's wrong with it and they have to remove it from the system because it poses a risk to people. And that's very, very sad when that happens because you can hardly blame an elephant for being grumpy when it's got toothache and might not even understand what's happening to it. So yes, they do. They do absolutely get sore teeth. Their molars generally, as far as I know, are relatively intact. Now, if I remember correctly, and sure, I mean, now I'm scraping the, the vestiges of my memory. I say vestiges like I have none. I've still got some memory left. But I think my fufunyan, the big male elephant in Kruger. He was the one with the big hole. You know, there was there was there were some great tuskers in Kruger. Very very heavy tusks, famous for them. There's a fantastic museum in the Lataba camp, the Lataba rest camp in the Kruger National Park. If you ever come and visit, highly recommend going there. 
Um, some of those tusks are at least double my size, if not more. That's just on one side. Um, and I think the Fufunyan was also suspected to have had an abscess. You know, Fufunyan is, is a sort of a name given to the angry, grumpy animal. It's not really grumpy so much as distressed, in a way. Now, he had a big hole in his head from where they suspect from another elephant's tusk. But I think he also, if I remember correctly, he also had an infection in his tusk that was making him particularly unhappy. Righty, well, as we continue our search along Arethusa, Brent is back on the vehicle. Let's see what he's found at the Juma Dam. Look at this. A little big herd of buffalo we bypassed a little bit earlier is now on its way to the Juma Dam Cam as we predicted it would. Chandra and I went for a quick look for those lions again. Fortunately, they're right in that sort of impossible to get to spot in the, the little riverbed there. But let's drive around to where the buffalo are drinking. I'm guessing probably around 200 or so buffalo in this herd. Nice sized herd for this area. Don't really get too many monster herds. And I have seen on the Sand River and south of here, I have seen herds around eight, 900 before. And then uh, actually northern Kruger, I've seen a herd probably around 1,000. But in this part of the world, we normally sit between sort of 100 and at the big end, 500. Well, Angie Lady says she hoped they pumped the pan. She doesn't know if the water is going to make it through this bowls of buffalo. So we are going to be doing a virtual reality section here. So I'm just going to stop a little bit further away so jean Dre can turn it on and we can do our clap without disturbing the big herd of buffalo. Beep, 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 beep. That's all the GoPros turning on. So let's just wait as recording. Am I ready to clap? There we go. And a, and a safety clap. So for those wondering what VR is, that's a VR rig. It's a 360 degree view. So if you have a smartphone or one of those goggle things, you can pretty much put it on and watch the video all around. So you can see what's in front at the back, right next to the car. So we're going to go take this and become immersed in Buffalo. we go, spreading from all the way through there up to the little water hole in front of the Juma Lodge. Now, a big herd of buffalo like this is going to have to drink normally twice a day, normally in the morning and in the evening. Don't be scared, fellas. We're not lions. Look at that. I'm just going to sit chat. So quite a few of them have drunk already and are moving away to the north. Now, as we move further and further into the dry season, a buffalo are going to have to start moving bigger distances between water and grazing. And this does play an effect in their condition, which makes them very, very or much easier for the lions to catch. Now, by no means catching uh, one of these big beasts is an easy feat, but especially as we head further into the, the dry season, it is going to be more difficult for them to evade as they're not in the best condition. Just behind the one in front of us, there's one having a roll. Oh, he's quiet. 
a beautiful, beautiful setting here. Lots and lots of buffalo. Now, the lions were not far from here, but that, because they're mating, it's unlikely they would have been attracted by the noise of this herd. Yeah, probably about a kilometer that way, or to the north east of us. Yeah, there's a bull coming down. He's got a, looks like he had a bit of purpose in his walk. Yeah, quite a few of them moving back to drink now. Amazing the jostling that happens. Even though there's plenty of space to drink, sometimes certain of the individuals will assert their dominance like that bull is doing now by sort of walking across the front. Looks like he's going to come a bit closer to us. You can see that massive boss. An adult male buffalo. Very hard developed boss. That's matted hair. That's very, very solid there now. And, uh, of course, used for fighting with other buffalo, as well as used as defense against animals like lions. Here comes an old female now. If you have a look just beyond the pan, the rest of the herd milling about and starting to move, you see all of them there. And of course, quite often with these big herds, there's always a few stragglers. The main body of the herd seem to have drunk before we got here. And if we look off to the right, as I said, there's often a few stragglers, and they normally are males. So there's a, a big bull down there, and there's still another one coming through. Ooh. Oh, yellow bull oxpecker. There we go. Look at that yellow-billed oxpecker, the rarer of the two oxpecker species we get here. And we do often find them on buffalo herds. Slightly bigger than the red bull, and of course you can see it still does have some red in the bull, but only the tip and the yellow at the base. Now we've got both species of oxpecker here. We've got yellow and red. Yeah, we're watching that beautiful yellow bull oxpecker on the back of that buffalo cow that's just leaving the pan now. I went come across a little bit to the right there, Jean Andre. Here we go. And there's another yellow bull oxpecker and a juvenile. Oh, and pop down. If you look carefully, I think there was, a, we almost had two oxpecker species on one buffalo for a second, but they seem to have moved around the back of the buffalo. Oh uh, no, that's another yellow bull. I did see a red bull. Ah, oh, there's the red bull. He's hiding on this buffalo closest to us. So we do have two buffalo, we have, there's the red bull oxpecker. And on the top of that buffalo he's gone there we go both species on the back of a buffalo this is not something you see very often if you go a little there we go both red bulled and yellow bulled ox pecker on the back of a buffalo that was a that's amazing now of course they compete for the same food source and the yellow being a little bit bigger sometimes does bully the reds and I think there's enough ticks to go around this morning. There we go. There's the yellow bull. Getting 
can see they've got a very finely sort of combed beak that they're using to sort of go through the hair, pick up any ticks or other, other little parasites that might be on the buffalo. What was that? Oh, sorry. I, I heard something and I lifted my head to listen. It almost sounded like a kudu alarm call. Quite difficult to hear with all these buffalo around. So, isn't this incredible? Both red and yellow billed oxpecker on the same buffalo. And we can hear them. There we go. There's a yellow bull chasing, was chasing a red for a second, but there, there's a family of yellow bulls. Male and a female and two little juveniles, and you can see their juveniles by the lack of colour in their beak. And oh, they just throw a tick. Looked like it. So I'm trying to figure out how many. Now it's quite difficult with the juveniles to tell the difference between yellow bull and red bull. I can see for definite two yellow build, and there's some red build with juveniles. So they might be the red bulls babies, and then on the other buffalo, there's a yellow bull and babies. You can see all the flies around the buffalo. Oh, just jump to this quick. Oh, there's a yellow bull attacking a red bull. So now that back buffalo there has got both species. And that looks, there's red bulls on the front buffalo. Oh, there's now there's, no, there's, there's oxpecker wars. Can you hear them all on the one buffalo? <laughs> Look at that. Yellow bulls, red bulls. Uh, I think the red bulls have got the yellow bulls outnumbered. And there you can see that they're physically a bit bigger. Oh, peck the red bull in the face. Lots of complaining going on, noise. This is amazing. And it looks like, oh, incredible. Now, that is definitely not something you get to see every day. Both species of oxpecker on one buffalo. But the last of the herd is disappearing and the stragglers are following. But what a wonderful sunrise safari it's been. And it's been great having you with us. And fortunately, Saturday, Cataday is safe with those two different lion sightings this morning. Um, two Birmingham males, one with an Nkuma lioness. Uh, they were mating. We could only hear them mate behind us and one male by himself. And, of course, lovely to end off with a nice big herd of buffalo. And Jamie had some elephants. And hopefully all the gremlins have been sorted and we we're going to be looking for those lions on the sunset safari. So don't forget to join us in a few short hours.